Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Loretta O'Sullivan. I'm Group Chief Economist with Bank of Ireland, and I'm delighted to be here today and to welcome you to this IIEA seminar. We are delighted to be joined by Professor John B. Taylor, who has been gener generous enough to take time out of his very busy schedule to come and talk to us. Professor Taylor is going to provide an address which will ask whether we are entering a new era of high inflation. He'll speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A, um, which we'd be delighted if all of you would like to participate in. And you can join that discussion through the Q&A function on Zoom. And do feel free to send your questions in as Professor Taylor is speaking, and we'll collate them and ask them at the end. When you're sending your questions in, if you could also please just identify yourself, so your name and your affiliation. And you can participate in the conversation as well in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. A reminder as well that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. So let me formally introduce Professor Taylor now and then I'll hand over to him. So John B. Taylor is the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution and the Marion Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University. He's also the director of Stanford's Introductory Economic Center. He's an award-winning teacher and researcher, and he has served as a senior economist and member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, as Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, and on the G20 Eminent Persons Group. Professor Taylor's book, First Principles, outlines his view on how to restore America's prosperity, and his most recent book is to choose economic freedom, enduring policy lessons from the 1970s and the 1980s. So, Professor Taylor, with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to you and let you take us away. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to Ireland, even though I'm in California on the other side of the world almost. But it's a pleasure to be here. I was at the IIEA back in I believe uh, 2014, so it's, it's a while ago. So it's it's good to be back, but it's it's, it's good to be here too. So we hope we get some rain, uh, but we haven't got it just yet. But um, I'm going to use some slides, uh, which which I believe will come up as I begin to talk here. And the title, I think, was in some sense a very apropos uh, of where we are now. Are we entering a new era of high inflation? That seems to be on people's minds more and more. And so I'm gonna direct my remarks to that for the first part of the discussion. And I hope we have a good discussion uh, after that. So let me just begin, um, if I may move the slides down. Yes, the, um, until very recently, uh, and I'm gonna focus mainly on the US, not entirely, but until recently, uh, we had been going back to what I call monetary policy rules. The, Fed Chair Jay Powell had said not too long ago, I find these rule prescriptions very helpful. Mario Draghi was then president of the ECB. We would all clearly benefit from improving communication of our reaction functions. And of course, Raghav Rajan was then governor of the Bank of India and said the same thing. But then the pandemic hit and uh, rules were out. Basically, uh, many central banks just forgot them. The Fed uh, didn't publish them. But it didn't take too long before they, back uh, early uh, last year, they put back in in the monetary policy report. Now the monetary policy report is, is issued twice a year in the US. So I look at it very carefully. And uh, so they put it back in, but then just uh, a month or so ago, they took them out again. And I think uh, there's a really a question about why they took them out in congressional hearings. Uh, Jay Powell was asked by uh, several members, uh, both of, uh, in the, House and the Senate, and he said he put them back in. So we'll see if they come back in. But the fact is, while they're in or out, has been only really small changes in actual policy. So even though there has been attention paid to the recent moves, it's there's still a gap between what I think a good policy will be, and I'll tend to define good policy by rules, not the only way to do it. There's a gap that exists between them and the actual actions. So this suggests to me that we are indeed entering a period of high inflation, unless some sensible monetary uh, policy actions are taken. So that's what I want to discuss. So I'll go to the next slide, which is just a picture on the US of real GDP. You can see it's through the latest quarter we have, the fourth quarter of 2021. We had this incredible hit as many of the world economy has, has done, but we're almost back to normal. In fact, by some measures we are. 
but if you look at the unemployment rate, which is the next chart, um, you see um, it's, it's stated here to January 2022, but we already have two more months. It's March 2022, and the unemployment rate is, is, four, is 3.6%. So it's come down uh, by 0.4 tenths of a percent since then. So you can see this gigantic increase uh, at the time that the pandemic hit, and it's really uh, really below where it was at the start. So, so in some sense, this is a returning to, to normal and, and the, the policy is not quite yet. So if we go to the next chart, it shows you uh, where we were right before the pandemic. And this is, a, this is from the IMF. You can see that there was uh, some growth in lots of parts of the world, not all over the place, but it was moving along. Uh, and then we then the 2020 hit the next chart 2020. Um, you can see it's all negative basically, if, except for a few exceptions. Um, and you can see Europe and the United States uh, were down in the negative area. But then in in 2021, most recent data, you see the next chart, we're back again. And so for the most part, we all see all green, which is great. Um, and so that's a sense in which we. Are getting back to normal. We hope it will continue. We hope there's not a resurgence of the pandemic. So let me uh, just, with that colorful background, let me go to the next chart and um, just think about monetary policy. M2, there it is, is has it grow grew rapidly uh, by a big step in 2020. Uh, it's been continued at a high rate since then. So this is one s one element of monetary ease, if you like, it's, and it's continuing. Um, so that's just a picture. The next picture is another uh, indication of policy. This is the effective federal funds rate, which is the main instrument um, which the Fed has focused on. And you can see it just, it just picked up in the most recent meeting by 25 basis points. And so that's about where it is now, but it's well below where it was before the pandemic and of course, well below what it was in other, other times. So this is a sense in which it looks like the Fed is moving back, uh, other central banks are as well. But let's look at one more chart, of, uh, which, which represents another element of monetary policy, which is the purchases of uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities by the Fed. And of course, this increased a lot during the pandemic in 2020, uh, but it still continued at a, at a pace until this month, and now it's stopped. It's not gonna continue. And the real question for the Fed is whether they start to reduce this again. There's real questions about whether this has had a direct impact, maybe some questions about that. It's aimed at the longer end of the yield curve, but I think the basic instrument is still, is still the federal funds rate. So we'll focus most on that, but this money growth and asset purchases are, are frequently referred to as part of policy. So let's continue the next uh, slide. This is really what people are talking about and really the reason for the title of the talk. And you can see there's been a real resurgence of inflation. Um, these are quarterly data. <clears throat> you can see the most recent observation, this is the United States of course, is 7.1% in the fourth quarter of last year. It hasn't really let up yet, but you can see it's a huge jump it's not quite as high as it was in the bad old 70s, but it's getting there. And in some sense, it's, it's really shooting up more rapidly than the past. And it's really has, the Fed has not until very recently paid attention to this. And one of the reasons they're paying attention is it's affecting the world, it's affecting markets more generally. So that's, that's the, the sense in which we are entering an era of high inflation, but we need to do something about it. So the next slide uh, begins to think a little bit about why there has been so little action thus far. You see 25 basis points quite low. And one reason was for quite a while, the Fed said, don't worry about this, it's transitory. It was low before the crisis. There's, there's a lot of talk about supply change and spe special impacts on uh, inflation, um, ships building up outside of harbors and things like that. Um, those are a factor, but it's not the main thing that's going on. It's been more of a distraction. There have been some small changes, as I mentioned a minute ago. The, the Fed has stopped the purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, but it hasn't undone them yet. So in some sense, the policy rule, which I'll talk about, 
which I think is, is really getting a resurgence of interest, is not yet part of the strategy. They really haven't talked about that, although they were and other central banks were as well before the pandemic hit. So that's in a sense, the rationale for a little action is don't worry about it, it'll go away. But I think now people have real questions about whether it will go away. So the next slide delves into this a little bit more. This is a table, sorry for the detail. This is a table that appeared in the July 2021 monetary policy report. So they do this twice a year. They just took it out, which it says in the, in the red at the, the bottom of the chart. They just took it out. Um, but this has all the rules that the Fed looks at. We don't know exactly how much they look at it. But the first ones, the, the so-called Taylor rules now quite been around for a while and they have adjusted rules. They're all pretty similar in many respects. And I don't need to go into the details, but the first one just says that the interest rate should be equal to the long run interest rate plus the inflation rate, plus the half times the inflation rate minus the long run, maybe the long run is two. And then the unemployment rate, they could have the output gap instead of the unemployment rate because they move so closely together as we know. But this is the really underlying the policy. And to some extent, I think one reason it was taken out in February is if you just plug in the numbers, you get numbers way different from the half a percent which the Fed has. So who knows exactly why they took them out. But as I'll show in a minute, uh, Jay Powell was quizzed about this in a recent hearing and he said he put them back in. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see this. Uh, I tried to document a little bit just uh, early last month in the House uh, representatives in the Senate. Um, Powell was asked why he took these out of the policy report because they were included as it says in the second bullet. Uh, in all the reports in July 2017. And Janet Yellen did that when she was Fed chair. Um, now, it's interesting, as it says in the third bullet, this emission occurred the same time the Fed got so behind the curve, just as the discrepancy between one of the rules that they focus on, the Taylor rule, um, and the actual policy, which was large as it ever been. And so that's why members asked uh, Jay Paul about this, and they brought attention to, the, to what was missing. And I think this was a good thing to do, but his answers were important. So I quoted him, one of the, he, he referred and answered one of the representatives by saying, we'll have it in the next one. We'll have the rules back. And he answered um, another one the same way. We'll bring them back in July. So we'll see if there's a return, but my sense is that there's been quite a bit of a notice of this uh, removal. And I think who knows exactly the reason they removed it, maybe because such a discrepancy. So if we'll go in, we'll now begin to talk about the rules a little bit more and what they suggest uh, in the next slide. So this is um, the settings of the federal funds rate um, back in September of last year, December of last year. And you can see it was beginning to move up. Um, it was still, 1% in 2021, point, sorry, 0.1 in 2021, 0.3 in 2022. That started to move up. These are actually from the reports that the Fed puts out. So you can see they, they began to move up in December, still well below, as I'll show you in a minute, what policy should be, I believe. Uh, but they started to move up and that's because they looked at the data that uh, many people began to complain. And so th this shows you the increase now it's continued, and I try to show that in the next chart, um, which gives you the continuation into March of this year. And you can see that now by the end of this year, uh, they have at 1.9% of federal funds rate, and then 2.8, 2.8. So this, this is moving in the direction of, uh, of higher rates. And so, and, but, but so far they're still actually at 0.5. Uh, and, and so it's still quite low. So this, this is still a signaling, which is important to be sure because people do look at the futures of policy and they try to figure it out. But you can see that the Fed has been moving in the direction which I think is appropriate, um, at least in terms of what they say they'll do. They really haven't moved yet. We'll see what happens the rest of this year. But this is an indication that they've begun to move. And, and it's just repeating what they've already there. I have a few more illustrations of that move in this next chart, 
These are the, this is the famous dot plot that the Federal Reserve has used to communicate about its policy. Each dot represents the uh, participant and FOMC members uh, estimate of where the federal funds rate will be. This is the December release of the FOMC. And so you can see at the end of this year, it's just 0.9, and then it rose to 1.6, still 2.1, quite below way in 2024, what, what we think it should be. The stars are just the averages of the dots, but the, the dots are the real thing. And this is what the FOMC has done. I believe this is a helpful way to indicate where they, they think they should go. It's, these, are, these are estimates or votes of what each member wants to do. But anyway, this is back in December, so things have changed, and that is illustrated in the next chart. Um, and so, yes, wow, this is quite a change. So you can see in 2022, the dots have all moved up. And so the average is 1.9. So when we say 1.9 at the end of this year, it's that average, and then it goes up. So the, the pledge is that it will go up to 2.8 by the end of 2023, stay that in 2024, and then begin to come down in the longer run. They don't say exactly what that is. But it, see, it seems like the peak is 2.8. And unfortunately, that even if they get to that, uh, the concern is it's not enough. Now, you have to give them credit for moving in this, this correct direction, but you have to worry about whether it's, it's enough or not. <clears throat> so this is really where they are now, both in terms of the, the, the actual dots and where they project they will be at the end of this year, 2022 and into 2023 and 2024. So the next slide begins to analyze this a little more. So this takes a little bit of, of thinking. And so this is the, the dots, uh, average dots, their stars here for the FOMC in the September of last year, December of last year. And they also indicate this, the rule, a rule, this Taylor rule, which basically just says that the interest rate should equal some constant times the inflation rates or some constant times the GDP gap or the unemployment rate. So even last year, they were behind by, by any estimate. The, um, and they started to move up. And so that's, you know, it's moving up, but it's still well below throughout. Now, as I'll say in a minute, the red line is a year ago. It's, it's 2021, so it assumed the equilibrium interest rate was 1%. That seems to be what the Fed has argued. It's using the CBO estimates, Congressional Budget Office estimates of, of inflation in the gap. But it's, it's, uh, it's only up there at you know, 2.83%. And um, the, the question is really what it is now, given the numbers I just showed you at the beginning of the talk. So they're behind by this estimate now. They, at the next chart shows you they've begun to catch up. The next chart, yes, there it is. So as of April, this is now plugging in the dots and average the dots over the years, over the, the time period I've indicated. So you can see now they've all gone up. In fact, they're getting close to the red line, but the red line is a year old. And so it's good they're getting in the right direction, but it still seems to be, uh, they still seem to be behind the curve as I'll show you in a minute. So, but this is, this is uh, I think an illustration of, they were behind the curve a year ago. Um, if you use year ago estimates, that's the, the red line, they're getting closer. But the real question is, are they close enough? And that's really the topic of the talk. So the next chart begins to delve into that. So this is some algebra which corresponds to the so-called Taylor rule. Um, and by the way, this Taylor rule has gotten so much more publicity in the last month than it's had before, which is good for me, but not so good for the Fed. The, um, the, the number 4.75 is the average inflation rate over four quarters. Um, the 0.5 are just coefficients that I've found to be useful. The 1.6 is the gap. And so it's 6%, so it's well above the 3%. Even if you plug in a lower inflation rate of four instead of 4.575, and you still get a number which is 5%. And so as you know from the charts, the inflation rate is, is a way above four already. And so, so in the sense, sense this, is this, this is why they, I think they are behind the curve. 
and you, we can talk a little about, bit about this. There's other estimates besides this rule, but uh, this is the one which uh, has gotten a lot of attention recently. So, so this, the main message here is that line I showed you in the previous slide is no longer three. Uh, it's, it's higher, maybe five, maybe 6%. And uh, that's what the algebra says. The next chart is a representation that I'm not the only one saying this. And this is a, an example of John Hussman is an economist, uh, same thing from uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer. It basically looks at the federal funds rate, what it should be according to the rules. And it's the light um, green line, I think it's light green. It says by this, it should be over 5%, 6%, maybe 7%. And the blue line is where they were until very recently, they're now at 0.5. So it's still a gigantic gap. And uh, that's what I think is getting people worried. If you look back in history and, and uh, you mentioned the beginning of the talk, I uh, recently uh, wrote a book with George Schultz. He just passed away, unfortunately. He was, was hundred years old. But we just wrote a book and uh, we illustrated how the Fed got so behind in the late seventies. And Arthur Burns was the chair then. He said, it's not us, it's other things. And so, he convinced President Nixon that wage and price controls. But there you can see it. And in the 70s, it was just the same kind of gap and things, and they didn't uh, make any adjustments. Uh, the wage and price controls were a failure. It really took a policy change in the 80s that made the difference. So that's in a sense, there's a, a we hope it doesn't turn out like it did in the 70s, but there's a risk that it will if there's not adjustment. So we'll go to the next uh, slide. and. Uh, this is just, an, you know, this, these are links if you're interested. These are all the things that I've just noticed in the month of March that have, people have been writing about this. The Wall Street Journal and their, and their main uh, editorial, keeping rates too low for too long was ignored except by me. <laughs> I like how they referred to me. And then they had this, the, uh, one, one of the um, writers has this chart at the bottom at the bottom, which I just replicated, that's the so-called uh, policy rule error. So they're way off, it goes up to seven, five, seven, six percent And then there's other examples. So this is just a, a handful of all the things that have been written about uh, the Fed being behind the curve. And you can see the headlines, uh, projected right hikes, won't sufficiently tame inflation, Kelly Evans uh, from CNB says, but it's just an example and there's many others. So I think what this is what this is showing is that we, yes, we have this academic work. Yes, we have the policies that the central banks use, not just the Fed, but other central banks, but they're still now catching up. And I think just beginning why we're seeing some adjustments. So if we go to the next slide, uh, please. This is kind of a summary of the sense in which the Fed and other central banks are still behind. I'll, I'll, I'll update this in a minute uh, with other central banks. But if you go back to, to July of last year, um, you know, inflation rate was 4%, the gap was minus two. If you assume the target inflation rate was two, which is what the Fed has generally been saying. And then the equilibrium interest rate of one, that's a little lower than uh, has been assumed. You still got a federal funds rate of 5%. So even if you now plug in uh, the most optimistic forecast at all. Suppose inflation falls to 2% by the end of 2022, and suppose output is equal to potential, then the funds rate should still be 3%. So they're well behind uh, in this estimate. And this even assumes that the so-called equilibrium interest rate is one rather than two, and it uses the average inflation over the four quarters, not the actual uh, average over a longer period. So. But I think in this sense, even if you make these adjustments go all the way, that say Nirvana is here, you're still behind. And that's that's the concern. So let me just give a couple more slides to wrap this up, um, if I might. This is a international issue. And, and that's why I'm so happy to speak uh, across the Atlantic into Europe and to Ireland in particular. But these principles, I think, I think we're gonna learn from this. I chaired a... Uh, a working group um, was created by the G20, I didn't chair, it was on, sorry. Um, and basically this argued before the crisis that we ought to 
have open capital markets, flexible exchange rates between countries or, or blocks of countries, rules-based monetary policy, and then to stop the capital controls because they get in the way. And um, had the report and basically argued that East Central Bank should follow its, its rule-based policy. And that will lead to a, a, a better international policy. So in some sense, the this phenomenon that I've mentioned with respect to the Fed is, is contagious. Who knows exactly all the reasons for that? Central bankers know each other, they look at each other, and they, to some extent, uh, the Fed is always not always in the lead, that's for sure. And they might not be at this point. And then finally, this, uh, the next slide just says that if you could normalize policy in each country, that you would get an international reform in general. And so my hope is that each central bank would, would describe and commit to its rule strategies. It doesn't have to be a numerical formula. That's what I do, but it doesn't have to be. And it's attractive because each country can do what they think is best for themselves, but it contributes to a global improvement, I believe, and, and uh, it will be a better circumstance. And then finally, I just to conclude, um, this, uh, this question which I was asked to address, are we enter a new, entering a new era of high inflation? I think the answer is clearly yes, unless there's a change and there's beginning to think about the change and that's good. Um, but it's now clear that central bankers have to be guided by some kind of a rules-based policy. They got so off um, after the crisis and continued it. And I outlined a method to do so. They should get, get back on a strategy that markets understand and that works. And of course, this would be something where the interest rate would increase if growth increases or inflation rises. And of course, that's already happening as we speak. Now, I would emphasize any strategy or anything a central bank has to do, can do, will do, is a plan. And all plans can be changed. There are rules, there are strategies. But I believe, and this is maybe the most important thing to conclude with, that some chances now, some changes now, if they're telegraphed and are relatively smooth, they don't have to be disruptive. But if they don't occur, we stand a real chance of a damaging change later. And that's really what worries me. And that's why I think we have to admit this is, all, this is a beginning of something that needs to be changed. And then finally, I think I just have some references. Um, I write about this all the time, talk about I think it's very important. So let me conclude at this point and, and see if there's any questions or thoughts uh, and uh, see if I've got you interested in this subject. So let me stop there.